Hi, I'm here with Paul Jones, Director of the Population Genomics at Illumina. Uh, thanks for joining us, Paul. Pleasure. Um, I want to take a bit of a more of a layman's perspective on this uh, initially. If, if you could just outline what population genomics is and what your what your objectives are uh, in the work that you're doing at Illumina. Certainly. So. Um, our experience around population genomics really stems from the 100,000 Genomes Project, which was uh, a government-sponsored initiative to um, look at rare disease and cancer and look at a large-scale program that would offer value into a clinical system, into the healthcare system, as a result of doing that. But there were three core objectives as part of the program. Mm -hmm. One of them was looking at um, an endeavor to, to discover, if you like, new diagnostics and therapeutics as part of this agenda. There was a second core objective that was really around um, preparing the healthcare system for a future of genomic medicine. And the third core obje objective was really around um, stimulating economic activity around genomics. And those three core agendas form the basis of what we do elsewhere now with other countries that are looking to try and emulate the Genomics England program, not, not necessarily replicate it, but have their version of that Genomics England program, often with those same goals or similar goals yeah. um, that really speak to an interface into the clinical agenda, making a difference to patients okay. whilst opening up a research agenda, so getting academics and researchers together with industry to unlock value that ultimately they may be able to bring precision medicines to this table. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the same time as just recognizing that there is the potential here for what we characterize as economic development. And so, as well as a clinical agenda, as well as an academic or research agenda, as well as having industry at the table, there is the potential to grow new companies, um, to encourage spin-outs from academia, um, to really stimulate um, a start-up mentality yeah. around where genomics might be going within a country in the future. And some people are you know, even creating hubs around this, mm -hmm. investing, raising funds to encourage that aspect of the program. And I would say, all four of those dynamics, those key stakeholders at the table, are in essence what we mean by population genomics as to what we consider important about it. So is your role, is that kind of a, a political one in the sense, I mean, you're, in the way you talk to the different stakeholders, uh, is that how you're, you're approaching them and you're, 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 you're negotiating with each one to see what, what can be... What so can Illumina be? as a company yeah. are often invited in because we're seen as a sequencing partner. So okay. we, we sequence the DNA. That's, what, that's usually why there is an interest in Illumina being at the table. Okay. The team that I am part of, we're population genomics, PopGen, as, as we call, as a, a short version of that descriptor, are really focused on making sure... Yeah, yeah, sequencing is great. It's a phenomenal part of what we stand for as a company. But actually, much more broadly than that, we're interested in making sure these programs are successful uh -huh. in terms of whatever it would take in relation yeah. to their goals around those different objectives and those different stakeholders. What are the kind of lessons that come from our experience, in my particular case of having been immersed in the, and involved directly in the Genomics England program? We have other countries now that are starting down their journey. What lessons come from that? Mm -hmm. Can we encourage other people to think about so they don't need to make the same mistakes? They can optimize the benefits of programs like this while minimizing the risks. And that's really what we're, yeah. we're focused on as a, as a, as a team within if, Illumina. If we focus on uh, the, the, the pharma and biotech as a stakeholder, could you just sort of outline how, how, you're, how you've been working with them, how, how, how much progress you've made, or what kind of challenges sure. or opportunities have been in that, in that arena? So as I look back to my time, and going back four or five years now at the beginning of Genomics England, I had a remit to say, how do we build an appropriate interface into industry, pharma and biotech, to achieve that goal of making sure we have new precision medicines yeah. on, the, on the back of this agenda in, into the mix? And I went out to industry, and I asked the most senior people we could access company by company across the 20, top 25 companies in the world and said, what would you need from a program like this in order that you see as valuable yeah. and valuable enough to pay for? Because we were looking at a commercial engagement model with industry. And they told us, and they basically listed... Um, things like linked data sets. We want the ability to access genomic data, but also linked to clinical data. Yeah. Um, the idea that you might be able to recontact patients was seen as incredibly valuable, not directly, yeah. but yeah. through the appropriate mechanism in the healthcare system. And, and the idea that you might recontact them to collect more data, potentially to collect more sample, potentially to recruit to a trial that might be testing some of the precision medicines that are in development was an extremely yeah. um, valuable thing that actually wasn't apparent in many of the other programs at that stage, any certainly four or five years ago, available around the world. So they were criteria that they, 
put in place, also around the kind of partnerships we were looking at, yeah. how do we build the ecosystem that includes them as part of that network. So they defined what they saw as valuable, and I went back to Genomics England and said, so do we think we can offer the industry this? Mm -hmm. And we characterized it in terms of an industry trial. We brought um, 12 of those companies that we talked to to the table in a pre-competitive consortium, okay. and they yeah. sat with us on a, we, we created a, a board, a steering group, if you like, mm -hmm. and that worked with us on a monthly basis, you know, regular face-to-face -face meetings to understand how we learned to walk before we ran yeah. with regard to the interface into Genomics England. And at the same time, we had uh, some of the teams within each of those companies, bioinformaticians, working on a daily basis, accessing the data, giving us feedback about how good a quality it was, how it might be better, what requirements were from industry. So, in effect, we set up a cross, a pre-competitive cross-country collaboration, which I think was extremely valuable for mm -hmm. Genomics England in terms of giving us as a company a steer as to what industry would see as valuable in order to achieve this ultimate goal of new precision medicine off the back of this kind of data. But there was also the opportunity, further to the initial engagement in a pre-competitive consortium, to look at what we call a direct engagement model. So an individual company might work as part of the consortium for certain aspects of, of what they were interested in, but if they had a particular interest in a certain patient group with a certain phenotype, certain characteristics of that patient, they could make a request to Genomics England to say, could we engage directly with you and talk to you about uh, you know, how we might develop a medicine specifically for that group of patients mm -hmm. and what would the terms be. And they were unique terms that were defined you know, in private between Genomics yeah. England and, and that yeah. organization. I think the principles of that model uh -huh. are ones that we take elsewhere when we go to other countries in the world who say, we'd like an equivalent engagement with industry yes. to do it in the most appropriate way. You know, the industry engagement has to be very professional. Everything is clear. You know, the consents that come into the program make it explicit from day one that industry engagement is inherent part of the program. So industry, more than anyone, are extremely conscious about the appropriate mechanisms to allow them to engage in the right way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and I would encourage, and I do encourage, you know, other countries to think about yeah. how they might create an equivalent interface with their endeavor. Actually, just brings me on to the other countries with your experience of Genomics England. How, how, what kind of challenge has it been? Because you, you're going out to a pretty diverse uh, group of countries, really, yes. Yes. Uh, at probably different levels of, of advancement with this, with this project. So how, how are you able to apply the lessons and experiences of, of, of England to, to these across the board? So if I give you just one specific example, we, we think about a framework for how we engage, and we talk about setting the right principles at the highest levels. How, what's the right governance model? How, what are the objectives for your program? How might you um, secure funding for this mm -hmm. endeavor? What might be the case to support why the funding make, makes sense? That's at the highest level. At the next level down, we talk about some major strategic decisions that we think could be key in informing the direction the program goes. And one of those decisions is about which disease area are you going to focus on, or is it going to be about healthy individuals? And the lessons that come in Genomics England's case, it was focused around rare disease and cancer. Mm -hmm. Other programs around the world, in some cases, want to emulate that. That, would, that yeah. makes a lot of sense in terms of offering genomic value, and they, they may do exactly as Genomics England said, it will start there. Other programs, and I'd cite Estonia as being one, are focused more on um, healthy individuals. And they're, and they're actually, they've got a beautiful program that is using genotyping, so, so um, focusing on large-scale genotyping at a population level to uncover from that uh, genotyping approach the risk factors, for example, for patients with a predisposition to familial hypercholesterolemia or breast cancer through BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations. And so they have set up a program in effect to identify and stratify their patient population to identify patients at risk, and then they are proactively reaching out to those patients to say, you may not know this, and obviously that's quite a delicate discussion, but you are predisposed to having FH in the yeah, future. Yeah. That is a really interesting dynamic. Different emphasis than was seen at Genomics England, but yes. when we have different countries often answer the question of what's your focus differently, yeah. and whether it's- And also have different approach to the privacy uh, and sometimes a, 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 perhaps a more advanced approach than... Yeah, I think I, I would say the privacy challenge is one... Or in terms one, of owning your own data and... Yeah, I, I mean, I say there, there are... I think there's some common standards that we would say we would encourage that yeah. would be common across countries. Yes. Um, the principle behind the Genomics England endeavour was one of what we called a reading library. 
as against a lending library. Yeah. So the principle was the data was stored in this reading library. Yeah. If you wanted to see the data as an industry participant, you came into the reading library, vir virtual environment, yeah. but you came in. Right. You couldn't take the books out. Yeah. And, that, and that, pr that analogy, I think, worked really yeah. well in terms of explaining the how important it was seen yes. to protect that data asset yeah. on behalf of, you know, genomics England reflected custodians of that data yeah. on behalf of the patients who, who had consented to be part of the program. For me, that's, a, that's absolutely the right rigor that needs to be applied in every other country we yeah. go to. And, and I wouldn't say that, that there is variability in how they treat privacy. Maybe what there could be in the future are different models for how you might implement that approach going forward if you were to incorporate blockchain into your, your methodology, yeah. give responsibility to the individual end user to decide who views their data or not. I think there's some interesting subtleties around that the mechanics yeah. of that that could incorporate new technologies in the future yeah. as, as that goes. Absolutely, and um, just not to steal ahead of uh, tomorrow, you're going to be having a chat about, about, about pharma and I guess the role within genomics, but if we could just, just conclude here, sort of broadly, what, what, what would you see for pharma's role within this and, and your, 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 your relationship with pharma and biotech? sort of the next few years, so what, key milestones. What we tended to see when, and I'm going, again, going back three or four years, yeah. that when we went to the most senior people within the company and said, we'd, we'd like to encourage industry, your company's engagement in our endeavor, what we tended to see were people coming from research or discovery to the table. Um, there were one or two companies from more of the development agenda that were coming to the table, and, and very, very few. I think it was, was one exception where the focus was on real-world products already in the market and the implications for genomics. So the way I'd characterize it from an industry perspective is at the moment, the emphasis within the industry, or traditionally you know, in the past, mm -hmm. it's been very much about discovery and new targets yeah. and future products that are probably at least 10 years away before they uh, are realized, before they come, yeah. come to market. I'm seeing an increasing shift more recently, moving from research into development, mm -hmm. and an increasing interest in, in terms of real-world data and pharmacogenomics, and how gen, gen, genomic insight can inform not just future medicines that may be many years away from actually being on the market, but also market, products that are on the market today, yeah. and, and maybe minimizing the risk of the wrong patients getting access to those medications, understanding what the interaction might be between multiple medications yeah. based on someone's genetic profile. So, I genuinely believe that genomics could have an impact on every single aspect of an industry's portfolio mm -hmm. and, and yeah, functional capability, if I can describe it right, from research, development, and the commercialization yeah. piece. But, but the, the industry interface, more broadly, beyond one company, into these kind of activities around population genomics is absolutely critical. They're, they're a key member of, of the range of stakeholders that need to be at They have a, a slice of the wedge. They have a wedge yeah. into these programs that's critical. Without them there, it would not be the same. You will, will not get precision medicines being developed on the back of these programs. Mm -hmm. You have to ensure that wedge that they create isn't too big. Is, it's balanced amongst the demands of the clinical community yeah. and the research community and the governmental agenda and economic development. But the critical interface from industry and, and how that's characterized, how it works for industry, continues to offer value. We have to constantly be um, exploring and, yeah. and making sure we, we deliver on. And, and I don't know any program around the world that I'm involved in now that isn't interested in balancing the needs of those different stakeholders with industry being a critical participant. Yeah, I think that's a good place to, to, to conclude it. So thanks a lot for, Thank uh, for joining me today. And uh, that's great. Thank you.